So good morning. I hope everyone's doing well today. My name is Drew Ken Kofi. I'm a principal engineer working at HSBC Cybersecurity Science and Analytics Office. At CSNA, we empower cybersecurity in protecting HSBC by leveraging data and innovative capabilities to create effective and proactive security measures, as well as enabling data-driven business decisions. Today, we will be presenting a talk on cutting the edge and fighting cybercrime. Reverse engineering a search engine language to cross compile it to PySpark. But before I dive in, I'd like to provide back on HSBC and also in introduce my co-presenters, Abigail Shriver and Serge Smerton. So I'm not sure how many of you here in the US have heard of HSBC. HSBC, HSBC is a multinational investment and financial services company. We have offices in several countries and territories with over 40 million customers and 225K employees spread across the globe. We operate many of our services and, and applications using the capabilities provided by the four main cloud providers. As you can imagine, with such a large worldwide customer employee base, in order to protect HSBC from bad actors, our global cybersecurity operations designed for scale, with the mission critical focus of using advanced data analytics to detect threats within our global estate. The, this mission is important as the average breach cost is approximately 4 million US dollars with mega breaches costing 100 times more. As you can see, the scale of cybersecurity at HBC is quite impressive. The combination of over 1,880 global cybersecurity team members, the presence of cybersecurity centers in over 16 countries and territories, a large array of global cybersecurity educational events for employees, and our advanced data analytics all support our mission of keeping our customers and colleagues safe. So what do we mean by advanced data analytics? At CSNA, we use advanced algorithms on massive and complex data sets to derive actionable insights to help protect HPC from the bad actors out there trying to cause damage. This is realized by combining multiple complex, large volumes of data assets with advanced algorithmic processing, which is engineered to be automated, executed reliably, and be performant at scale and at pace. Our complex data consists of multiple sources of interrelated data capturing of net flow logs, endpoint activity, email and IM activity as well, and much, much more. Examples of our advanced data analytics used to provide insights to our SOC for threat, hunt, for threat protection include the use of machine learning algorithms built to detect anomalous account activity, suspicious beaconing, and automated generated domains. So some background on us. To help protect HSBC from the bad actors, my day-to-day -day responsibilities focus on helping engineer the next generation cybersecurity analytics tooling, which is focused on advanced threat hunting and analytics, leveraging our cyber lake house. My colleague Abigail Shriver also helps to this end. She is the lead cybersecurity engineer also working in CSNA, and she works on developing the next generation network security analytics. Particularly, Abigail has been instrumental in our effort to migrate customer traditional security information event management threat detections to Spark. Abigail will follow my talk on traditional sims for cyber. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Serge Smerton. Serge is a resident solutions architect at Databricks. He has been a wonderful partner in our modern cyber lake house journey. Following Abigail's talk, Serge will take us on a deep dive on the innovative transpired technology developed to help fight cyber crime using Databricks. So in this talk, I'll provide an overview on traditional SIM systems for cyber and the challenges we have experienced with trying to execute advanced data analytics on large and complex data sets. Abigail will discuss our team's journey of migrating existing traditional cybersecurity SIM threat detections to our cyber lake house. She'll also discuss key business outcomes and benefits associated with our migration. You'll learn about the benefits gained from our migration journey like decreasing time and resources for cyber data processing migration, improving cyber threat incident response, and fast onboarding of HSBC cyber analysts onto Spark. 
within our Lake House platform. And Surge will guide us through the technical journey of building equivalents of a query language into Spark and how to implement, implement another, search query lang another search query language features that are not possible out of the box, like IP CIDR matching or fuzzy matching across all columns. The technical deep dive will show how we implemented or actually reverse engineered custom det threat detections written with traditional SIM search, pro search processing language and translate them to what Spark understands. Okay, so let's dive in and first discuss traditional SIMs used for cyber. Cybersecurity is a massive big data problem. In CSNA, everything is an asset and thus important to our mission of protecting HTPC from bad actors. Our collection of, of important asset data amounts to data volumes of 100 to 200 terabytes per day or 38 to 79 petabytes if you calculate that within 13 months. So let's put this into context. This is like storing 10 times the contents of every book in the US Library of Con Congress every day. Now with this volume of data, we need the ability to process and analyze this data at scale for a myriad of threat detection use cases. In cybersecurity, the, tra the tradition is to use SIMs to analyze cybersecurity data for threat detection purposes. To this end, SIMs are a popular platform. But we have experienced some challenges with the use of traditional cybersecurity SIMs. Traditional SIMs are great at what they do, providing analysts a platform for processing and searching on recent data with data volumes of less than 30 terabytes per day. Many cyber analysts and threat hunters don't know anything other than traditional SIMs. Many analysts are not too familiar with developing threat hunter analytics with SQL and Spark. In cybersecurity, it is quite common for traditional SIM cyber analysts or threat hunter as part of their day-to-day -day work activities to access the traditional SIM console, write some search code, apply filters, do some data conversions, report and clean up. So for not so large data volumes, this arrangement works okay and allow cyber analysts and threat hunters to analyze cyber data and look for suspicious activity with a good level of speed and efficiency. But for larger data volumes, greater than 30 terabytes per day, traditional SIMs struggle as they're not necessarily engineered for ingestion, aggregation, joining, searching, and reporting on vast amounts of data. These struggles amount to scale and difficulty and time consumed attempting to process large data volumes and perform threat hunting queries. Moreover, licenses to use these traditional SIMs are quite expensive and can strain the budgets of cybersecurity teams. With, with HSBC cybersecurity having data volumes greater than 100 terabytes per day, with data sets providing facts on network traffic, email, DNS, and proxy activity needed for scalable and reliable threat hunting analytics, traditional SIM data volume, the tr traditional SIM data volume and cost challenges led us to create a cybersecurity lake house to overcome these limitations. Yesterday, our colleague, Ryan Harris, a principal engineer in CSNA, detailed our cybersecurity lake house journey during his talk on accidentally building a petabyte scale cybersecurity data mesh in Azure with Data Lake at HSBC. Please check out his recording of his talk where he explains our architecture, performance, and capabilities for large-scale cybersec data processing and analytics. But why is this so hard? If you were to Google cybersecurity, we see beautiful sci-fi pictures. The reality is, is that traditional systems are simply not set up for success. With hundreds of different security tools to deal with, issues with data locked in with vendor tools, challenging integrations with a myriad of cyber data sources from network, endpoint agents, email intelligence feeds, IMA vulnerability management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes quite daunting to properly manage all of this while focusing on the critical mission of protecting the bank, keeping the bad actors out and, and informing the SOC of any threat hunting findings. So the Cyber Lake House has helped immensely in tackling these large-scale data processing and analytic challenges, from economically empowerment of a modern lake house to the ability to perform near real-time threat detections using Delta Live tables, allowing us to handle the complexities we're processing 100 to 200 terabytes per day 
from performing transformations, aggregations, and joins for enrichment to generating gold production ready data sets that can be used for ML and AI with the ultimate goal of finding those needles in the haystack which provide insights and findings to our SOC for threat investigation and response. Although our Cyber Lake House provides great benefits for over traditional SIMs, we ask ourselves, what can we do to port over the existing Threat Hunter SIM code and ETL models to the Lake House? There are plenty of ETL models and custom threat detections already done in traditional SIMs, but unfortunately it's not trivial to migrate them. And we had an important need to lift and shift these threat detections to the lake house due to our challenges with SIMs. We immediately realized that lifting and shifting of hundreds of these detections would be cumbersome and inefficient. So we huddled together, had a discussion with Surge and asked, is there any way that we can automate and port these detections over easily? And Surge being Surge said, yes, we can do this. We can build a transpiler, and guess what? Off we went. So, at a high level, the a migration of our custom traditional SIM threat detections to Spark using the transpiler consisted of building of the transpiler jar, attaching it to a Spark cluster, tweaking some configurations, getting it into a notebook, importing the transpiler main class, and finally executing the primary function to translate search processing language code to PySpark. Now, Abigail will speak further on our migration tra via Transpire journey within our lake house and take us on a deeper dive into the engineering details of this effort. Thank you, Jude, for providing an overview on the current landscape of HSBC and traditional seams. Now we're gonna be jumping in to see how HSBC took search processing language queries and migrated them over to PySpark queries. First, we compiled a list of 60 core functions and commands that we frequently saw leveraged in the search processing language queries that our analysts were using for production grade analytics and detections. These were the first functions that we focused on implementing in the transpiler to quickly migrate over those existing queries into the new lake house ecosystem where we could leverage more data sets with longer data retention, allowing us to do historical analytics at scale. Implementing the transpiler, Surge and team developed into our environment was quick and easy. Maven was leveraged to create a jar file with all the code and dependencies that we needed to get started. This job file was then needed was needed to jump in and start leveraging and tra the transpiler to immediately start delivering business value for our customers. Once we had that jar file, we were able to quickly attach it to the Databricks cluster in our environment, leveraging the UI, and jump in immediately to unlock the potential of the, converting the search processing language queries over into PySpark. You can also leverage the Databix clusters in its script and point it to the DBFS path that you need and have uploaded the jar file to as an alternative way to integrating with the Databricks clusters. In short, taking that transpile that was created and integrating it into our environment was quick, easy, and seamless. So now that we have the transpiler and all the dependencies installed into our ecosystem, what do we do? We had plenty of search processing queries ready to go to quickly migrate over to start unlocking and leveraging the value and potential of the data, our Databricks environment for rides. Luckily, our Databricks environment had already had terabytes of historical endpoint detection data ingested and registered into our Metastore for us to use. If you would like to know more about how we got all that data into our lake house and Go ahead and listen to the recording of my colleague Ryan Harris's talk, accidentally building a petabyte scale cybersecurity data mesh in Azure with Data Lake at HSBC that he presented yesterday. So using this search processing language and converting it to PySpark, we took this search processing language query that you see on the left, fed that into our transpiler, and then output it the PySpark code for us to be ready to use. You'll notice that there's enrichment logic that we actually implemented in between the output it code from the transpiler and that enabled us to custom, easily customize the transpiler's output to meet our individual needs for this use case. 
So how did we do this? Data in a search processing platform, it'd be great if it was just equal to what we got in Databricks, but it's not always that easy. Sometimes you have to have those customizable solutions to meet your own needs because there isn't that one-to-one -one mapping. As I said, it's not that simple. However, with our enrichment logic, we were able to go ahead and implement some of the common enrichments from the raw data that came into our Delta Lake house and make functions that could be leveraged across all of our use cases. First, we filtered the data as much as possible, and then we enriched it with those fields that are needed for all of our use cases, unique IDs, usernames, IPs, you know, the things that in security we really care about and tend to matter. And lastly, we aggregated that data and packaged it into a nice, small, easy to understand format and size for an our analysts to leverage. We wrote that aggregated data back to a new Delta table to leverage downstream for rule-based alerting and use cases. It really was that easy. <laughs> we discovered that despite those challenges that came with any data that we were leveraging of the size and volume and scale that we had, there were custom automated solutions that could be leveraged in our environment to easily migrate these use cases at scale. So now that we've seen in action how we took this clearance pile that was developed by Surge and team, and he, Surge is gonna do a technical deep dive a little bit later, but first, who cares? What value did we get from all this work? How did we take that advantage data from Databricks to leverage the historical data at scale in a cost-effective manner? Well, first we got automation at scale. We were able to have scheduled jobs and leverage Databricks jobs either at a time-based trigger or an event-based trigger to automate these use cases or for those one-off use cases, we also were able to use that one-time run feature in Databricks notebooks. Additionally, we leveraged the transpiler to easily pass in parameters where we could get the widgets that Databricks notebooks offers to pass in and customize our use cases to make our jobs and one-off cases easy and quickly to customize for our customers and business value. Lastly, the execution was made easy with this process. We were able to execute the transpiler directly in Databricks notebooks if needed, or leveraging Python, or that jar file. So there were lots of options for us to obtain this automation at scale. Next, the thing that all of our business partners, our key senior stakeholders care about. What about savings? What about the cost? First, the time and resources. If you can quickly evident that reconciliation between different languages and platforms was going to be a very lengthy process if done manually. Time was saved by automating this migration, leveraging the transpiler compared to the manual translation that was previously occurring. The original use case that we did took over three sprints to convert once we got all of the data quality issues worked out, discovered any of the differences between the search processing language platform and our data prints platform, and then made those enrichments that we discussed earlier onto those use cases. We then migrated an additional two use cases manually, and that was able to, we already saw cut down in time of getting to be able to implement those two use cases in one sprint. But with the transpiler, we were able to reduce those two weeks of works into a day or less where we could also work on several different use cases concurrently. This enabled us to reduce our cost in data storage as well. We no longer had the need to store data in more than one location, and the only copies of data that we were storing were already aggregated and filtered down to the level that our analysts needed for rule-based alerting and other use cases. Our compute was also reduced. There was no longer the need to do an in-depth EDA on every single use case. We didn't have to familiarize ourselves with each data set. We were able to take the transpiler plug in the queries and leverage the compute in a scalable way that we were able to use it on multiple use cases at once. All of our jobs are able to run concurrently and re that further reduces the compute necessary to convert all of these use cases over time. Lastly, business metrics. 
We're able to now go back in time. We're able to see data from historical data loads that simply was not level able, as Jude explained earlier, in traditional seams due to cost or performance issues that would, everyone would encounter. With Databricks in the lake house, we have successfully identified and implemented several security use cases, leveraging this historical data, going back at least a year at times, and sometimes even more, joining across high volume data sources that would not be able or possible to um, complete in traditional seams. And of course, there's that forever infamous incident that wakes you up and you and the team's up in the middle of the night or a weekend and the data is always the root cause or the root solution to figuring out exactly how to respond to those incidents. This tool can be leveraged quickly to answer questions during an incident. It gives analysts the ability to use the query language that they are most familiar with to answer those questions, leveraging more historical data loads and joining across all of the data sources that we have available in the lake house. This cuts down the time that is needed to onboard users into Databricks in our ecosystem, and they can learn Spark while they're delivering real business value. So of course, learning is good. The transpiler is something that can be expanded and leveraged by cybersecurity teams across the industry to bring the language that analysts know and love to answer questions at scale. Analysts and engineers are able to quickly learn Spark or vice versa, learn the search processing language if they know Spark already, while developing queries and use cases the ling and the, in the language that they already know. When there's no effort necessary to take the search query and convert it over to Spark, analysts can look at the output at PySpark code that we saw earlier from the transpiler to understand what they would need to, quick, to do to quickly and easily write brand new news, use cases directly in Spark from scratch. This makes it way easier to onboard users, brings the usability to them, and has them start leveraging Databricks as they can continue to leverage what they already know and their background knowledge. Now, we will do a deep dive into the technical work and architecture that went into developing and productionizing the transpiler. Serge, senior resident solutions architect at Databricks, will go into the work and the logic that went into de developing these 60 commands, functions, and extensions of the search processing language and transforming it into Spark code. Hello, everyone. I hope everybody uh, knows SQL here. Please raise your hands. Who knows SQL? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Only 10 people. OK. Well, uh, like, uh, this thing is not really a SQL. So uh, like, uh, for, first of all, I want to thank you to George Webster for supporting this innovation idea, because uh, no way uh, uh, this thing could uh, have uh, flown without him. So kudos to George. So essentially, like. You heard about problems, having thousands of ETLs done in another language, and you see that language in I didn't know that language, I know SQL. Well, actually don't know SQL that much, but yeah, well, okay, yeah, whatever, let's translate it, because it's easy, translating a language from one to another. And uh, uh, essentially, this deeper dive uh, uh, would be about how to create a translating compiler. And what is a translating compiler? We first parse it, creates abstract syntax tree, then we translate that abstract syntax tree into the uh, internal Sparks Catalyst core that we use either to run on the uh, Spark clusters in Databricks or to generate the Python DSL code out of it. Because, I mean, we either need to translate or reconciliate. And yeah, it was a bit more work, but uh, more fun. So let's actually dive deeper into it. So uh, if you know Apache Spark, you know that there are like many different stages of uh, uh, query execution. Like we start with SQL query or data frames, then we create uh, the unresolved logical plan, then we get resolved logical plan, and then we get optimized logical plan, and then we have multiple different physical plans, and so then we have like this uh, executed physical plan, and then we get the results. So we were working on the level of uh, unresolved logical plan. So this is a hardcore talk. So yeah, everybody knows SQL. This is not SQL. So uh, here you see a very simple query to select uh, HTTP access logs uh, that errors. 
like 400 errors that are, eh, okay, expect it, or 500, like, ooh, no, you should not have those errors. So yeah, this is like uh, what the typical query in that language looks like. I mean, in real life, it uh, fits uh, on two screens, but yeah, this is the simplest because you would not understand uh, it from the slides. So we had to translate it. But the first thing we do with uh, the language is that we write the parser. And uh, what is a parser? Parser is something that takes tokens and uh, translates them into uh, the uh, classes that uh, represent those entities. Essentially, you make trees, you make forests. Everything is a tree in the world, yeah. Unfortunately, it's computer science. So uh, we use the library by uh, one of uh, our Databricks employees called FastParse, and it allowed to create a, a parser in Scala code where every uh, parser part was a parser combinator that could be stuck together, tested so easily, and allowed us to have like, I don't know, 80% coverage on uh, the code base, making it very easy to uh, add new features without uh, breaking anything uh, else dramatically. So yeah, all in all, everything starts with code in a language that is parsed using the uh, parser, in this case, parser combinators in Scala, and then we always have tests. Okay, now we have uh, uh, a simple command in uh, this language called search command, where we search for a field uh, that can have two wildcards, like either field is the uh, 400 uh, error or 500 error. Cool. Now we need to do something with it. And uh, we actually want to translate it into Catalyst. So internally, Spark core of execution is built on top of uh, Project Catalyst created by Marco Amberst a couple of years ago in the scope of uh, Spark SQL. And uh, all in all, Catalyst is a simple uh, uh, collection of different trees uh, that are optimized, and, uh, uh, and this is something that every SQL query or data frame gets transformed into. So, okay, let's create uh, the Catalyst expression. So essentially, here you see where code is in two wildcards, it's actually translated into or uh, code starts with four or code starts with five because this is how Spark understands it. That is how a search processing language understand it. And uh, another thing is what we as humans mostly understand. So yeah, our goal in the, in the intermediary step was to translate everything to Catalyst. And uh, this is exactly like uh, what it was. We were creating unresolved logical plans uh, to put entities of one language and concepts to another. And sometimes, from time to time, we actually had to uh, do uh, what could be considered as uh, compiler optimizations. Because uh, as uh, you see, like there is one statement where field is in, but in fact, it had to be uh, optimized and translated into yet another data structure uh, to represent uh, the intent. So uh, if you think compiler optimizations, optimizer rules as a big mystery, well, it's not. Just a bunch of lines of code and uh, they're not that difficult uh, uh, for those who write Scala and uh, this is the example of uh, one of those that translates where field in wildcards into the or statements. Now, uh, our next goal was to translate the Catalyst query presentation into the PySpark code. Because essentially, Catalyst was something that we could already run on Databricks clusters because it was PySpark, uh, it was Catalyst DSL, so it was running like a normal data frame or a SQL query. Uh, with the same speed, and so now we actually wanted to manifest it into the Python code, which was added to the ETL, because nobody would run ETL through this search processing queries. So, yeah, we had to generate the Python code. And generating the Python code was actually way easier than uh, with, uh, the, uh, uh, with uh, the search processing uh, language to the uh, Catalyst transformation, because uh, we had to operate with strings. We didn't have to translate from one case class to another, we just had to, oh yeah, okay, 
let's create a big humongous drink and recursively uh, uh, drill down and add uh, more things to it when we need it to do it. And uh, yeah. on the left, you see a bit of the deep dive on how production grade code generator actually works. Because yeah, everything that uh, we have in cross compilers is actually generating code, making it from one format to another. And this is yet another adapter to it, maybe a bit more sophisticated. So uh, yeah, that's actually it. And so this is like a 10 minute intro how to uh, make a completely new uh, uh, query language on top of uh, Catalyst engine of uh, Spark and even generate uh, code out of it. And if you need to do something strange like that, uh, you kind of uh, build up on uh, the knowledge uh, or experience we had and know what not to do. You should definitely do testing because test-driven development is the root of all success of uh, complicated projects because without tests, so instead of writing uh, things for a couple of weeks or months, we would have been writing the similar thing for like a whole year. So. Thank you, say thank you to the presenters, to Abigail and Jude. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll let Gray uh, coordinate that. Yeah, we have just about a few minutes for questions here. So if anyone wants Good. the mic, please Abigail. feel free to just raise your hand. And... So the reverse translator from Catalyst to PySpark, uh -huh. um, can that be used elsewhere? Because I can imagine a lot of a lot of situations where a user may want to, for instance, translate from Scala Spark into PySpark or from like PySpark into Spark SQL, I can see a lot of usage of that reverse translator. Oh yes, indeed. Uh, it uh, could be used, but it has to be decoupled from uh, this code base and probably uh, uh, rolled out as a separate project. So it cannot be taken as is now, uh, but it definitely can be taken apart and extended uh, because uh, essentially we just translate from Catalyst into the uh, actual code. So translation into SQL from a uh, Catalyst tree is relatively easier because most of the concepts are already in SQL. The biggest challenges of reverse translation, as you call it, uh, or code generation, as I called it, is in making the generated code readable, meaning like you have proper formatting, you have proper identification, uh, you don't have too many uh, uh, brackets uh, to surround your uh, expressions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is something actually I've, uh, came, I've been coming across in many different uh, projects in many different customers where uh, we have a SQL query and we have to generate it's, we want to generate the PySpark DSL for it or vice versa. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, like this is something we should pursue. I don't know. Uh, let's uh, talk offline about it and uh, brainstorm ideas because uh, uh, it's pretty common. Just more of a process type of question, how many data sources uh, have you, did you use to make this case study happen and, and, um, and are you using all the data sources to do advanced analytics also to solve the, just not just one use cases but a lot of different use cases and um, do you also have a search module or web-based uh, queries that you can do uh, you know, analytical searches on as well? So it was a multi-team effort, and uh, uh, it was team uh, of uh, Ryan Harris. So Ryan, please stand up. Uh, Ryan was uh, showing uh, yesterday a talk about uh, building a petabyte scale data mesh. Essentially, we had uh, one uh, big data source uh, uh, that we had to make Spark friendly uh, to get the biggest, biggest performance, and we had some other data sources. So Ryan was working on uh, getting like the best uh, core ETL pipeline for uh, this main data source, and Jude and Abigail were working on like uh, actually porting the use cases over and connecting other data sources as well. So uh, it was a multi-team effort, uh, primarily based on one biggest data source, but then there were other things. So uh, it took a while. So. You can uh, reach uh, to Abigail and uh, Ryan yeah. offline. If you like, we can speak offline and, and get into those details. Hi, mine is not a technical question, just a 
general question. Will the presentation be available uh, later because some of my colleagues couldn't attend today. I would like them to review it. So I just wanted to check. Uh, well, uh, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the yeah. question was really just, is this session going to be available later? So it's going to be available on the portal for, I think, about two weeks. They can still register. Like, registering as a virtual attendance is totally free. And then about over the next couple weeks, all these always make it onto YouTube. So what, what, it depends on the time type of thing. But yeah, either way, yep. Cool. Excellent. All right, well, maybe a great big round of applause for our final presenters of the day. Thank you. Thank you.